Welcome everyone to uh, Levitt Safety and WES production or uh, presentation of the Wireless Evacuation System webinar. I'll pass it over to Derek McEwen now to uh, start things off. Thanks, Matt. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Good day. I'm Derek McEwen, uh, Market Segment Manager for Fire Systems and Mining Technology. Uh, first, on behalf of Levitt Safety, I'd like to extend our heartfelt thoughts to all Canadians and globally during these unprecedented times. Levitt Safety, of course, remains here as your partner to ensure that we get home safe always. There's been lots of changes with physical distancing and isolation practices, but Levitt Safety is still here to help protect those Canadians doing critical work in industry, uh, providing essential services and products, and especially even to our front, especially to our frontline healthcare workers who are out there in the line of fire every day in the trenches doing the hard work. Uh, a few quick meeting notes. The webinar today will be recorded and emailed out for those of you who registered. So expect that in your inbox following uh, the webinar. Uh, also, please be patient uh, during the webinar if there's any connectivity issues that may occur. It's kind of the new byproduct of everyone and their our new home, work from home policies. So uh, again, just please be patient. We'll try to fix everything as we can. Um, Levitt Safety is very proud to introduce the West 3 wireless evacuation system. We partnered with Ramtech late in 2019 to bring this disruptor to Canada. And though West 3 is new to the Canadian marketplace in North America, it's not new in general. It's been available in Europe and abroad for quite some time, which has given it some time to prove that it's reliable and robust enough for the harsh environments in which we want to put it into. So we're very glad to have Ramtech as our partner. Uh, West 3 is being adopted very quickly here due to some the innovation, innovative solutions in which it provides. Uh, it's really an improvement on the old methods that have been around for a long time, focused on solving evacuation, medical alerts, uh, and fire detection. Um, so construction's changed a lot over the last few decades. It's now time for us to make sure that we're protecting the people and the assets and changing with those those changes in the construction methods. So. You know, we have larger timber frame buildings, uh, increased fire loads in all types of construction, and the need to detect and evacuate becomes more paramount as these things change through time. So uh, the West 3 system also has some real application during these particular times. Uh, construction or other workplaces, uh, permanent or temporary, may be unprotected and unmanned. So uh, the West 3 system is there to ensure that the emergency response plans are there to meet your needs too. Uh, and this can be achieved even via a uh, monitored or remote solution. So um, yeah, West Street is quite powerful in these, these capacities. Um, please remember again, that there will be a recording of this webinar. It will be emailed out to those of you who registered. Um, we'll also be doing a question period at the end of the webinar. Uh, please put your questions in the question field. And the voice you just heard at the beginning, uh, Matt Burtney, one of our organizers, he will uh, be fielding those questions for us. So uh, with no further ado, uh, please allow me to introduce John Tyre from the U live from the UK here. Uh, he's the North American Business Development Manager and he's here to present the West 3 system for you in further detail. Go ahead, John. Great. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, hello, everybody. I was hoping to be in, in Oakville for this presentation, but we, uh, we've obviously had some, some travel issues over the last couple of weeks. So um, it's great with modern technology how we can still get it done and, and show you our solution that we provide. So as Derek mentioned, we're, we're going to be going through um, various different topics here. So first and foremost, WES was developed for construction sites, so for temporary protection during construction, but it does have a multitude of different applications as well. So um, again, Derek mentioned the temporary buildings. We've done um, several tent structures um, in, in recent days. Um, we, we also do things like shipyards or, or ships being built. So again, that requires some kind of temporary system. Um, outdoor storage facilities, if you have some kind of um, large outside facility, the units are IP rated, so they can be outside as well. So although we're gonna focus a lot on construction during this presentation, it does have a multitude of different applications as well. So going through the itinerary, um, we're going to do a brief introduction of WES and, and Ramtech. I won't spend too much time on that. And then we'll get into the, a bit of the background. So why are fires 
increased on construction sites, why, why it's much more risky on construction sites. Um, some of the consequences of fire does start on construction sites. Um, the current solutions that are out there, and then we'll go on to our solution. And I've got some units with me here. We'll, we'll flip onto a, a video call and we'll, we'll do some um, live demonstrations for that. And then we'll have the question and answer section at the end. So this is the, the, the WES system. WES stands for Wireless Evacuation System. So it's a completely wireless system. There's no power supply required. There's no interconnecting cables required. And they will all communicate, obviously, wirelessly. So the, the unit that you see in the center there, this is the connect unit. This, uh, this is basically the brains of the system. Um, the system is fully addressable. So this will get all the notifications through to the connect system. And then it will send you also a text message or communicate with the reactor offsite. And then to either side, we have the sensors. So we have a dust resistant smoke sensor and we have a heat sensor there as well. And then we have the manual activation core points here with an audio visual device and a manual push button and also the medical alert function here as well. But we'll get into that in a bit more detail a little bit later. So a bit about Ramtech, we've, we've been around for the last 30 years. We're, we're celebrating our 30 year anniversary this year. Um, and we've always been in wireless security products. So WES was launched in 2009. We were approached by the, the UK construction industry um, as legislation was, was changing. So health and safety legislation, the HSE guidelines were changing. And it said that there needed to be some kind of activate, uh, evacuation system on construction sites. And they realized that the air horn just wasn't doing it. So contractors were installing wired systems and, and, and temporary systems in that way. And, they had the challenges that, that, again, we'll talk about a little bit later. So they gave us a shopping list of things that a wireless evacuation system for a construction site needs to be. And we tried to, to check all of those boxes for them. So we're in over 20 countries. We're all throughout Europe, in Middle East, Australia, and we've, we've just started to enter the North American market now. Um, a lot of our focus as a company is on R&D. So any new product developments, any, any upgrades to the system, then um, we have in-house R&D technicians to do that with us. And we have around 100,000 100, WESH units installed worldwide. So although it is a new product to the North American market, it's not a new product to the construction industry in general. So a little bit of the timeline here. So you can see back in 2009, we had the WES product. This was uh, the 1.0, if you like. Um, 2014, we got the EN54 certification. Um, that's the European standards for fire alarm systems. And we added in a couple of extra features. So we went to the WES Plus. And now fast forward to 2019, we now have the WES 3 system. So going back to the R&D department, we do take feedback from the, the industry and upgrade our system with, um, with relevant updates as, as required. So let's get into a bit of the background then. So why is the fire risk increased on construction sites? Um, I'm not sure how many of you are in the construction industry or in the, the safety industry, but if you spend any time on construction sites, you'll know that they are very hazardous places. So you've got there in the, in the bottom right hand corner, the, the triangle, which most people will be familiar with. So to start a fire, you need oxygen, you need heat and you need fuel and a construction site provides all of those three in abundance. So we've got a lot of ignition sources, so hot work's going on on site. You can see the, the grind in there, but then you have the welding and, and lots of different hot works. Um, people still smoke on construction sites. I know that every construction site will have a sign saying no smoking, but it still does happen. And, and there, there have been a couple of fires that have started due to that in recent times as well. Um, in the cold climes of, of the Canadian market, in the winter times, you've obviously got heating. So you've got propane heaters, uh, gas heaters, which again is, is an ignition source in itself. Um, you add into that the combustible materials. So you've got packaging, lots of different packaging, a lot of timber frame buildings. So you have sawdust, you have drywall, all those kind of um, things that can actually start the fire in the first place all around the construction site. And then gas cylinders as well. So lots of different ignition sources and combustible materials there. 
So this, this graph was developed by um, an insurance company here in, in Europe, just to illustrate the level of risk of fires on construction sites. So you can see in this box here, this is for a new build, um, you've got the, the risk of fire going up here, and then the time, so the, the, the time of the, the building's lifespan, if you like, across this bottom axis here. So at the start of the project, the fire risk is really low. Um, you've basically got a hole in the ground, you're starting to do foundations, you're doing excavations, there's not much that can really catch fire. Um, but then as you start to, to develop the pro project, you start to put the walls on, you start to put the windows in, you start to put the drywall in place. Um, this just keeps on increasing and increasing. You get in subcontractors to do fit out works um, and it builds into like this huge crescendo just until you hand over the project because everyone's rushing to get the project finished everyone's rushing to get it handed over everybody's tripping over themselves until the end of the project when it's handed over to the client and then the risk reduces dramatically because that's when the permanent systems come online you've got the sprinkler systems you've got the detection systems and it's the the finished building as we're probably all sitting in now although most of us are working from home um an office block you would expect to have this level of risk when you've got this level of risk here, this is what the construction guys are facing, as well as adding into that things like risk of falls, working from heights, all that kind of stuff. And they shouldn't have to deal with this high risk factor here as well. And the same is with refurbishment. So it's not just the new builds, obviously, it's the um, it's the maintenance projects as well, or the refurbishment projects. So this axis here again, it illustrates the, the building is occupied and then switch off the permanent systems maybe you're gutting out three, four, five stories. You, you isolate the power, there's no power supply in there anymore. So you need to put some kind of temporary system to, to bridge this gap. That's what we're trying to do is bridge this gap in the building phase here. So if a fire does start on a construction site, so it, it is, we have all the ingredients to start the fire, but what, what actually happens if it does start? So the permanent systems are not yet in, pla in place so fire doors the firewalls so firewalls are rated in stairwells so you might have a, a two hour firewall five hour firewall whatever the local standards are and that means that the fire cannot spread through that wall within this amount of time so it gives people time to evacuate the building so this is all under progress during the construction phase it's not yet in place so it's not a finished building we shouldn't expect the the construction site to do what a finished building will do because it will not um, like I mentioned, the fire doors are in place. They generally don't come on until the end of the project because the contractor doesn't want them to get damaged during um, the construction of the building because they're quite expensive. So um, these things come in at, at the last minute. You've also got um, penetrations through the walls. So you have pipe penetrations, electrical cable penetrations. And again, the fire and the smoke can spread through those really rapidly. I know that some developers and contractors are trying to again bridge that gap, um, but there are always going to be some gaps in that in that process as well. Um, it's not the fire that generally kills people; it is the smoke. So also, smoke spreads very very fast. Again, you don't have the internal windows and doors in place; it's just going to go straight through the building. So, the importance of getting everybody out as fast as possible is really important. Um, the evacuation conditions are not great either. You might have things in the egress routes. You might have, I know, again, we try and do the best that we can and keep the egress routes all nice and clear, but again, it's a construction site. It's constantly changing. You're gonna have ladders there. You're gonna have things hanging from the ceiling. It's gonna impede that egress path. So again, giving people enough time to get out of that building is very, very important. Um, and on construction sites, unfortunately, there's a very high risk of arson as well. So it might not just be a fire that's set by the things that I mentioned in the previous slide, it might be people intentionally setting these fires, or, or maybe not even intentionally, maybe it is people causing trouble, um, but it might be homeless people trying to get some shelter in the, in the cold temperatures in the evening, they cook some food, that fire gets out of control, and then the fire starts. And um, we've also seen a fire start on a construction site where people come in to steal the, the copper cables. So they steal the copper from the cables, but they don't want to take the plastic, so, they melt off the plastic and then they just take the copper and, and, and take it off site to sell. Um, but obviously that's not a very controlled environment. They're trying to burn that off as fast as possible and it can get out of control. So there's many different ways that this could happen. So in the next slide, I'm gonna show a, a video here. Um, this is the, the fire department arriving at a construction site. And I just wanna want you to, to bear in mind where this fire is, ready for the next slide. Thank you. 
So you would think that this this is a construction site, obviously, on the on the left hand side. The fire department arrived on this project around four minutes after being called. So they're there nice and early. You would think that they will be able to get this under control. You know? And you can probably guess what my next slide is. Um, so this is the this is the project, and this is just after eight minutes of the of the firefighters being on site. They couldn't contain it. Um, they don't want to send firefighters inside the building because it's treacherous conditions anyway. When you put fire involved in that, we don't want to put anybody in that risk. So um, this was fairly recent, back in February in 2020, um, 8 a.m. Um, so during working hours, luckily no one was injured uh, or no one was killed, um, but there were some minor inju injuries of people passing by. And again, that illustrates the, the heat and the, the hazards that are built up just from this construction fire. Luckily, again, there's no buildings around, so there is, there is a real risk of this, um, this fire spread into other buildings around the nearby area. So a few statistics here. I've been trying to find the Canadian numbers, but it's, it's a struggle to find it. The same as the UK figures, to be honest. We, we keep them nice and buried, but um, this will give some kind of indication of the number of construction fires. So this is from the NFPA um, um, documents. There, there is a standard called NFPA 241, which is um, fire protection during construction, demolition and renovation. And it gives some really good guidelines in there. It basically allocates responsibility to the building owner and generally to the contractor and the fire prevention manager, the fire prevention program manager, um, which is generally the health and safety person. They're, they're generally the people that take this responsibility. So just going through these figures here, and these are annual averages, by the way. So you can see very high number. This is over 8,000 fires per year in the US. So the US construction um, spends or the US construction market is around 10 times the size of the Canadian market which is very similar to the UK market as well. So even if you divide these numbers by 10, um, it's still a very, very high number. But again, if, if anybody does have those figures, I would be really interested to see them. But we have seen general correlations between construction spends or construction markets and the number of fires on the, in individual countries. So some of the consequences are if a fire does happen on a construction site. So first and foremost, the most important thing for everybody is to go home safe at the end of the day. Like I mentioned earlier, we're all working from home or working from offices and we expect to be protected. If something happens in our environment, we want to be able to evacuate the site safely. We want to be notified as early as possible. It should be no difference for the construction guys as well. They're just there trying to earn some money. You know? So we want everybody to get home nice and safe. So that, that's number 10, <laughs> sorry, number one on the list. Um, everything else is 10 steps below that. So all of these other things, they do have an impact, especially if you're a developer or you have a financial um, um, stake in the game as well. So significant project delays and related costs. So I was on a project in Texas um, a few weeks ago, um, about a month ago, and it was a uh, student accommodation. Timber frame building, student accommodation, as you see um, a lot of projects throughout the whole of North America. They told me that they had, the reason why they wanted to protect that site was they have a lot of students around that can again, you know, we all know what students are like sometimes, um, there's, a, there's a risk there, but also there's, there's a delay, it, there's a delay clause um, in their contract. So every unit that they have, they have to pay 150 US dollars per day every time they delay for a day. So they had over 100 units on this development. And that, that charge was because the, the university would have to put up those students in hotels or something like that until the project was completed. So it's a justifiable cost, but you can imagine $150 per day per unit, it turns into a, a very high figure. So um, there's damages to building, the building structures, um, including historic in interests. So um, we obviously saw the, the Notre Dame fire in, in Paris that was under renovation. That was an extreme example, of course, but we do have a lot of historic buildings in, in North America, courthouses, libraries that we just want to protect. You can't replace that. So that's not really a monetary value. That's, that's a historic value that we need to protect as well. Um, the financial losses, we did see that on the NFPA slide, but that was the direct property loss. So that was what it's going to cost to, to rebuild that to, to the stage that it was. But that didn't take into account the assets. So um, 
the fixtures, the fittings, the, the equipment that's on site, even down to drills and, and, and people's personal equipment, all of that will be damaged during that construction fire. So that would have to be replaced as well. Um, there's also a risk on what the insurance will cover. We've all dealt with insurance companies. I'm not sure if any are on the line now, but we know what it's like <laughs> to deal with those guys. So they're not gonna pay out as soon as possible. So if you can prove to them that you've done every step possible to, to protect against this fire, but it still happened, then they're more inclined to, to have these payouts for, for the people involved. And um, there's a question of responsibilities as well. That's going back to the NFPA 241 standard. There is, um, there is guidance in there to say there are people that are responsible should something happen. Um, so there are people that are criminally liable um, should there be a death and there is negligence there. So again, it's more of a question, is, is that are those processes all in place? Um, damage to the corporate brand and, and adverse publicity. So we've heard the saying, um, any publicity is good publicity, but it's not when a <laughs> construction fire is on. So one of the first things that we see when there is a construction fire, the, the local news crews turn up outside because it's a, it's a, it's a juicy story. Um, you can see the, the company flag flying in the background and it <laughs> says the, the, the contractor name on there and it's just not good publicity. So um, again, with, with all that in, in place, we don't want that to happen. And then um, one, of the, one of the other worst things is if the fire is large enough, it can easily spread off-site to different buildings around, especially in built-up areas, Toronto, Vancouver, these kind of really built-up areas. If, the, if there is a project being built, it can really easily spread to other buildings. And we've seen that happen a lot. Um, buildings in the surrounding areas need to be evacuated. And again, those people, smoke goes into those buildings those people need to be accommodated elsewhere as well. We've even seen it melt buildings that are parked on the street and things. So it gets very, very intense. So again, another short video here. Um, the guy does get out safe, so there's no need to, to look away, um, but it does illustrate why it's so important to, to get this early notification throughout the site. So you can see up on the top right-hand corner there, that guy, he's wearing his helmet, he's wearing his PPE, he might have been wearing ear protection, he might have been wearing earbuds or something like that, listening to music, and he didn't hear the, um, the evacuation for whatever reason. Or maybe he did, it just didn't get a chance to get out there. So he's been stuck up in that top right-hand corner there. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. You can see the, the intense heat there. It's melting the windows. It's, it's, it's forcing him to... To take his life into his own hands just even here that could have been the end of the story just there but luckily he, he landed the jump and um it, it's going to be really hot on that top balcony i tell you so you can see the, the windows melting out there the, the fire department are already on site they're already there they've got the boom lifted out they're trying to get him down as fast as possible this video is just over two minutes long but it feels like it's much longer when we're willing this guy to get away from that building I need to move that truck up. Oh, my God. I think that we probably should be going. You can hear the concern in people's voices as well there. They're across the street and they're worried about it. So you can see, go on to the boom lift nice and safe. Oh, my God. So just in time, really, and it just illustrates seconds do matter. The fire department was on site, um, everybody was there, but that guy still got stuck up there for whatever reason. So um, a little bit of legislation here from the Canadian market. So um, this is the BC, and this is specifically for construction fire safety. Um, so I can I, we can share these links with you again. It'll be in the presentation when when we send it around, but we can send over the full document as well. So you can again see the the fire triangle here. It's um, they understand that there are a lot of ignition sources, a lot of combustibles and things like that as well. But you can see this was developed because there, there was a, a fire. I'm going to flip onto that in the next slide. There was a fire here. In the Granville Street, a building that was 80% complete and it set on fire. So you can see in these recommendations, it's a fairly short document, it's around four pages long. It just gives some, some outlines here, but 
it does actually say to install some kind of battery powered smoke alarm for the, for the construction process as well. And this is the, the fire that they're referencing there as well. So like I say, 80% complete, you can see it's, it's almost ready for occupancy there. It was for, um, it was retire, retiree accommodation and that's gonna delay the project by three, four years. I think it was just handed over in, in 2019, but I, I would need to confirm that. And you can see this happened in 2014. So it delays the project by a lot as well. So some of the current solutions, I imagine everyone would put their hand up when I say, do you use air horns on, on your project? Because everybody does. <laughs> We've seen it on almost, every, I've been in, in on many construction sites now throughout the Canadian market and everybody uses air horns. So it's okay if it's a small development, if it's a small, maybe one or two um, family dwelling, something like that, that's fine. Um, but as you start to get into uh, shopping malls, hotels, hospitals, tower projects. We've seen air horns being used on, on a 30-story on a tower. Um, you don't want people to go inside the building to, to press these air horns to evacuate the site. You want, to, you want to be able to evacuate that site as far away as possible. And again, get that communication constant throughout the site. So we have seen a couple of um, projects in, in, in New York, um, in LA, use wired systems. So it's a temporary wired system. It's basically a, a string, uh, a cable that goes up the site and it has various audio visual devices going up the project. And again, that's, that's a, a decent system, but labor is very expensive. Electricians are very expensive and it's a construction site. So we've seen those things get, the wires get cut, um, which again, makes the system completely, re completely redundant. There was a a project that I went to where the reason we were called in because they had an evacuation. They wanted they flipped the switch to evacuate, and the the units didn't go off because the the system had been decommissioned, uh, had been um, cut, which deactivated the system. Um, so it needs to be some kind of supervised system. And then you've got text message and app notifications. So they are good for general communication. So if you want to say we're finishing at 2 p.m. today because there's some weather coming in, we want everyone to go off site, something like that, that's fine. But in an emergency situation, you can't rely on that because people might be in the basement. They might not have cell service there. Maybe their battery's gone. Um, you don't want people checking their phones constantly as well. So it's not a reliable source for an emergency when we saw that guy stuck in the building. It's not an efficient way of, of getting that notification fully throughout the site. Um, just going back to the air horns, because the air horn is the, um, is the topic of this, this um, presentation to ditch the air horn, because there are better solutions out there. A lot of the, the larger projects, if they've got a crane on site, they actually communicate with the crane using the air horn as well. So when the, the crane has hooked up their load when it's okay to, to carry it away, there'll be a blast on the air horn. So that air horn noise does turn into a bit of white noise to the guys on the site, even if they can hear it. Um, and especially if you go into a built up area or something like that, it, it really does just turn into background noise. <laughs> um, the only way that you can communicate is with that loud audio visual on every floor. Um, in the cold temperatures as well, uh, the air horns freeze up. So um, we've seen a couple of people go out, if they do a, an evacuation drill, this is not even just a, an emergency situation. They take two or three air horns because they know that this thing is gonna seize up as soon as it gets into the cold temperatures and they start blasting it. So they need to have a couple of them just as backups as well. So we can all see it's not a reliable system and I'm, I'm pretty sure that most people would agree it's not a reliable system. So what I'm trying to propose is, what kind of system should we put in place? So an interconnected wireless system is the best practice for job sites. So um, going back to the system earlier, you saw that we have various different components. Um, the way that WES was developed 10 years ago, it was basically a control panel, uh, the base station, and then audio visual devices with a manual activation. And that's all the system was because it was for evacuating the site. When we get onto the live demo and a uh, short video now, um, you'll see that we do have different components now, like we have sensors to pick up smoke or pick up heat, just to give that 24 hour protection as well. Um, but first and foremost, it is an evacuation system. It's meant to get everybody off site as fast as possible and give everyone that, that fighting chance to get out of the building as soon as something happens. Um, 
it doesn't have to be for fire as well. We're focused a lot on fire um, because that is a very big risk. But we've seen other projects where evacuation has been required because there was a gas leak. So this was actually in LA. There was a gas leak on a, a main street um, in LA. Someone was doing some work in the street, not even on the building itself. Um, they hit the gas main and they had to evacuate, I think it was two or three blocks around it. Obviously, all the office blocks, all the, the residential buildings, they were all evacuated safely. Everyone was kept away. But there was a real lag for the construction sites to evacuate. They just didn't get everyone out in time. On one of the projects, it actually took them over 12 minutes to evacuate the site, which is obviously not acceptable from, from anybody's, um, anybody's book. So not just fires, it's gas leaks, it's um, inclement weather. Um, we've also seen the WES system set up in um, an office block where they used it as a, a totally separate system to a fire alarm system for active shooters and things like that. Now, I know that that's not a massive issue like it is in, in other parts of the world. So um, just to give you an idea of different applications as well. So what I'll do now, I'll show you a short video. It's about two minutes long. I'll have a sip of coffee and then we'll go into a live demonstration so you can see how the product is, how it is to install it, how fast it is to set up, because it's one thing the manufacturer is saying, it's easy to set up, anybody can do it. But until you actually see how easy it is to set up, I would like you to, to appreciate that from, from, a, from a live setup point of view. So just watch this video for a couple of minutes, it'll give you a, a bit of background, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail on the system. Many traditional evacuation alarm systems simply can't cope with the complex challenges of today's built environment. West 3 is different. Developed by the experts at Ramtech Electronics, West 3 uses the latest technology to create a completely wireless system that provides a unique way to protect your site and its occupants in the event of an emergency. West 3 is quick to install, simple to operate, and is completely customized to meet the needs of your site, no matter how often things change. You can include an unlimited number of units in any combination and add, remove, or reposition units as many times as required. Every unit has a three-year battery life under normal use, so there's no need for an external power supply of any kind. Simply turn the units on and they are ready to go. The West 3 range includes the very latest innovations in wireless alarms, including medical call points, heat and dust resistant smoke sensors, and an interface unit for connecting to other link systems on site, such as a building management system or standpipe monitor. West 3 now also incorporates West Connect, our next generation emergency control unit that brings enhanced ergonomics for ease of use and full 4G connectivity for wirelessly connecting to cloud-based management platforms, such as Ramtech React. Together, the West 3 network and the React system provide total 24-7 monitoring of your site activity from anywhere in the world. The West 3 units provide real-time notifications of incidents on site, while React sends notifications to all nominated personnel via the React mobile app. This combination of wireless, cloud, and mobile technologies ensures accurate details of site incidents are delivered to those that need to know when and where they need it. It's this use of technology that has made West 3 the system of choice for evacuation safety on sites around the world. To find out more, visit www.westsafety.com. Okay, so I'll just come out of this presentation for a second and get on to the, to the video here. Okay, how am I looking, guys? Okay, good stuff. So um, this is the, the WES3 system. You can see there, this is the, the Connect device. So you can see it's pretty bulky. It was designed with construction in mind or industrial applications in mind. So it's meant to be robust and hardware in for construction sites. Um, you can see it's completely wireless. There's no power supply required, no interconnecting cables. They all communicate with the, um, with the antennas here. So a little bit about the wireless technology. Um, it doesn't need 4G, it doesn't need um, GPS because it creates its own wireless network. Um, each individual device will boost the signal around the site. It's called a flooded mesh network. So we work on a, a 916 megahertz frequency. Um, distance between two units on a perfect project line of sight, 
um, you're looking around a thousand meters, but when you get onto a construction site, you've got the concrete, you've got the walls and doors and things like that. It does reduce that, that wireless um, capability quite a bit. So you're looking around 100 meters between two units. Now, because each individual device will boost the signal, um, it doesn't need to be 100 meters to the base station, to the control panel. It just needs to be within 100 meters of the next unit because this unit will boost it to this one and this one will boost it to this one and it will create that, that full network. So even if you have a, a tunnel project or a, a long distance to travel, you can kind of daisy chain these along as well. And it does set up this network by itself as well automatically. So there's no need to, to program as such. So going into the, um, into the programming, so to, to switch on each of these devices, you hold the A button and press B three times, that powers up the system. So you can see here, it, it talks you through step by step what you need to do to set up the site. So it's meant to be very basic and easy to install. So you can see here at the first, first option, it gives you different languages. So we do have English and French on here as well. Um, so depending on which region you're in, so I'll select English for now. And then, so one of the one of the other advantages that, that we found with, with WES3, um, again, feedback from contractors. What was happening sometimes on construction sites is Friday at three o'clock when everyone was tired of a hard week, they wanted to, to go to the pub, <laughs> whatever it may be. Um, they would activate one of the devices and then everyone would evacuate off site and go home. So what we were asked to do is to build in an inspection delay. So what the inspection delay allows you to do is validate whether it's a real emergency or whether it's just a false alarm. Okay, so you can set it at the inspection delay at zero, or you can set it in one minute increments up to 10 minutes. So depending on the size of your site, you can change this as required. So this is gonna ask you at the, at the start. So as you start to add, add devices, it will all copy that information across. Okay, so I'll set it at two minutes for now, just for, for demonstration purposes. It's going to tell you here that it's going to increase the time to evacuate the site. So we select yes. Um, another function that it has is a pre alarm. So, as that inspection delay is counting down from whatever you've set it to, it will, you can set the pre alarm to activate these audio visual devices. So, as it's counting down, each device on the system will chirp. So, it will make a sound. Um, you can have that as a yes, a yes or a no. You can set it for pre alarm or not. So again, I'll just set that for yes for demonstration purposes, and that's it. So we've programmed the, the the base station now. This is all the programming that the the base station needs really to set up a system. So what we want to do now is start adding devices to the system so we can start to to take them out onto the project. Okay. So the system is addressable. So any of the devices that are connected to the system, we can allocate a unit number to each of the devices. So we can differentiate between the, the floor level, through the exit stairwells, whatever it may be. So when you get a notification from a device, it will tell you on the, on the base station and also send you a text message to say this unit number has been activated. So that comes into a really good effect when you have this medical button here, which again, I'll talk about in a second. So. What I've done here is put the unit number in the system. I will activate this device as well, just by switching it on. I hold the A button on both of the devices. Now this is call 003. I take another device and this can be any configuration. It doesn't need to be a set system. It's, it's completely modular. So if you wanna add 100 of these and only two of these, that's fine. It will work in any configuration. So I've just changed the unit number on the base station. Sorry, I need it to be flat and I'll explain why in a second. I hold the A button down on both devices. Now this is allocated this unit number. So there's no programming to say this one has to speak to this one, this one has to speak to this one. They all create this flooded mesh network. So it sets it up automatically. Okay. So um, it, the base station is also password protected, so not anybody can go in and, and add units or take units away or, or mess around with the system. So each of the devices does have um, a few safety features on there. So if I move a device, you can see I've just lifted that one up. It has a tamper switch on the back. So when it's installed, if someone tries to remove it, 
you will get a notification on the base station to say unit number such and such and then the fault that's happened so it does have a lot of different faults so it is a fully supervised system so if the battery goes low if the signal goes low if a unit gets knocked off the wall and falls away from the system if the tamper switch goes off if someone removes the detector head um, any of these kind of things you will get all those notifications back to the um, back to the base station as well okay so fully supervised system we've got a working system now um, the connect unit can actually be mobile as well i've set it to mobile mode which has basically deactivated this so if you do have a security guard on site or fire watch on site whatever it may be this can be a mobile unit that will travel around with the guy i know it looks like a 1980s mobile phone but there you go <laughs> that's what it is um, so this is the the basic system that we have here um, if there's a medical emergency on site Again, these are, these are flat on the ground because the tamper switches are pressed in, so you can't really see it that great. But if I press the medical alert now, it's going to send a notification to the Connect to say there's a medical emergency at this location. So that doesn't set off a full site-wide evacuation because it's a local incident. So this would then notify the Connect unit, but it would also send a text message to the first aider, project manager, whoever you set up on the system. We also have the React platform as well, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about shortly. So if there was an um, activation on site, if there was a, a, a reason to evacuate the site, I have a sound suppressor in here. It is after 6 p.m. here, so um, there's nobody around, but I'm still gonna cover it up anyway, because it does get pretty loud. It's, it's over 90 decibel sounder, and it does have a, um, a, a visual device as well, so a flashing beacon. So if I activate the system, that's gonna, this is the pre-alarm function now. So it started to count down. You can see system's counting down from two minutes. So what would happen now, I've gone out on site, I know the unit number, I know which one's been activated, so I'm gonna go to that location and check whether it's a real emergency or not. So now I've been out on site, I've, I've realized, yes, it is an emergency. Um, it does have another safety feature, which um, hopefully you can hear me over the noise, but it does have another safety feature if two devices are activated it will kick out that inspection delay because it knows it's a real emergency evacuation okay and that's any two devices whether it's a manual activation whether it's an automatic activation okay so i've been out on site i've realized that it is a real emergency now i just override this timer and then it's going to go into follow up okay. So it's, it's a very loud alarm. So we can either do one of two things. We can reset it with this key. It's a security key, so not anybody can just reset this system. It needs to be a special key that we provide with the system. So we can reset this call point now, and then that will silence the system. So this is now communicating with the rest of the devices to make sure there's no other activations. And um, you can also silence it from the, from the control panel as well, from the base station. Okay, so we'll just let that calm down now. So while that's while that's communicated and, and, and powering down, I would like to talk about this device. So this is the basic system. So we have, like I say, the, the heat sensor. We also have a dust resistant smoke sensor, which is pretty important. So to limit those, those false alarms. Um, dust resistant smoke sensor is a, a dual optic sensor. So it, it differentiates between steam dust and smoke so it doesn't it doesn't alarm with dust because construction sites are dusty environments um, we also have an interface device so the interface device allows you to connect into any other third party device by relay logic so it has inputs and outputs so i've connected it into this push button just for demonstration purposes so if i press this button the relay would activate in the interface and then set off the west system but this can be anything this can be a building management system it can be um, anything else that you want to evacuate and activate the web system and with the output as well it can also connect into third-party devices such as turnstiles um, magnetic locks on doors um, elevator recalls and also again building management systems so if it's a renovation if you want to uh, notify the building management system that there's an emergency on the construction site again it can send that notification so many different applications for this and I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit more about that a little bit later with the presentation as well 
So they're the, um, they're the basic devices, and, and really that's how simple it is to set up. And, and as I mentioned earlier, it is one thing the manufacturer is saying how simple it is to set up, but it really is, hopefully you've seen that there. And um, if you did want a more in-depth presentation on the product itself, we can arrange that, I'm sure, if you get in touch with, with Derek and the guys at Levitt. Um, the, the guys do have uh, stock available locally as well, so they can, again, when we get the movement of people, they can come out and give you live demonstrations and, and maybe do some, some testing on your site as well. Um, like I mentioned as well, this, the units are IP rated. So um, this can be outside, that's the tamper switch activating again. So these units can be outside. So if you do have a facility um, where you want to add on some extra evacuation devices, this can be plotted around out there as well. Now, just bear in mind, we do have three-year battery in normal application, um, but that's at normal temperatures as well. So we do have product installed in Scandinavia and in really cold temperatures and it does affect the battery. So we just want to um, let you guys know that it is going to affect it. It's an alkaline battery, it's replaceable. Um, you do get a notification to say the battery's going low on individual devices, so you get plenty of time to swap out that battery so you're not going to have any downtime on the system as well. Okay, so that's that. Um, that's the, the product demonstration, really. I will jump back into the presentation now, if that's okay. I'll go over a couple more points. Um, we've got about five, five, ten minutes left of the presentation, and then we'll go into some, some questions and answers. Okay, so hopefully you can see that okay. So just, just as, a, as a recap, um, it's completely wireless, robust for construction sites or industrial applications. Um, it's reusable on multiple projects as well. So project is, I don't know, a year and a half, two years, depending on the size of the project. Once the project's finished, we're not going to throw these units away. You're just going to take them, decommission them, turn them off, and then redeploy them on the next project. It wipes the memory when you switch them off. So it's really easy just to, again, take it as an asset in a central and then redeploy them on the next project. So it is meant to be reusable. We've had, we've still got units out there from 2009. So it's a, it's a really robust product. Um, an unlimited number of units in any combination on site as well. So because we don't rely on the control panel communicating with every individual device separately, we, we have the flooded mesh. So each unit is going to boost the signal around. We can have an unlimited number of units there. Anti-tamper features is the tamper switch that I showed you on the back. Um, it's really time and cost effective as well. So when you compare it to wired systems, that kind of thing, it really does um, lend its own to that. No wiring required, so no extra cost there, um, no extra time to do it, and no extra maintenance to move them around as the project develops as well. These are really easy to locate, relocate around the project. Um, again, easy to install and maintain. We've seen, again, a couple of really fast-paced projects. Again, we don't want don't to dwell too much on this, this terrible situation that we're having globally at the moment, but we have seen these on-site shutdown. So as the, the projects are being told to close up, this is a rapid deploy situation where the, this can be deployed within, within half a day on the site, and then your site's protected. You're going to get off-site notification should something happen. And then we get reporting functions as well. So each of the devices has a, a USB connection where we can download any activities and it gives the date and the time and what the incident was. And then you can put that into your monthly reports or whatever it may be. Um, so going back to the interface module. So I, I talked about connecting them to third party devices, but what we've seen in the North American market, which we haven't seen in Europe because we don't have so much uh, sprinkler systems is connecting it into the, the riser main. So when you've got the stand pipes, um, they're obviously full of water, so that's ready for the fire department to connect onto should something happen, uh, or should a fire happen on the, on the construction site. Now, that's a risk by itself. You don't want water on site. It, again, if it freezes or something gets knocked, you're going to get water flowing on that site. So you need to know if that, that that um, standpipe is activated. So we can connect an in interface into a standpipe monitor. So if water starts flowing, it's going to send a notification to the base station, to the connect unit, and then it will send a notification offsite to say you've got water flowing in this location. So 
I just thought I'd, I'd raise that because we have seen that on many, many sites in, uh, in the US in particular. Um, it can be a mobile unit as well. Um, again, we've seen these kind of applications that can be made up on site with that, that plywood there. You can see this timber build, uh, this timber frame that you've got here. It's got the core point connected to it. And then it's treated like a first aid emergency station. So if there is a medical emergency, you can press the medical button that alerts the the first aider or the, the, the medical professional on site, but then you've also got the first aid kits available as well as the egress routes should there be an evacuation process. Um, also this mobile stand as well, so if you're doing hot works or something like that, you don't really need this, this sensor here, but it's just there again for illustration purposes. Um, you can wheel this station over to where they're doing hot works, leave it there for a, for a day or so if something happens because these fires smolder and things like that. So Again, just to give you that extra level of protection, this can be a mobile unit that you're gonna, gonna move around the site. I'm just gonna touch on this point briefly. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I know we're, we're running a little bit low on time, um, but the video does give a really nice explanation. So what we're looking to do is connect the, the WES system into a cloud-based app that we have. So this app can be, it's a subscription basis and it can be downloaded by an unlimited number of people on iOS or Android. Um, so this is a, a short video here. Rantech React is a cloud-based platform that delivers 24-7 monitoring of your site and provides accurate real-time information about incidents on site to the individuals that need to know. With three decades of experience in wireless technology and IoT applications, Rantech Electronics developed React to it assist site managers, owners and safety groups in protecting their teams, their assets and their properties using an intuitive, user-friendly, cloud-based solution. React is ideal for areas of industries where emergencies are a realistic factor to consider. From the React app, site personnel, management teams or lone workers can raise an alert if an incident such as a fire, water damage, security breach or other issues need urgent attention. There's also an SOS feature allowing personnel to raise the alarm which pinpoints their exact location and an optional geofencing function allowing certain alerts to only be sent to personnel physically on site. These alerts then notify in real time key personnel who need to act on specific alerts such as health and safety officers, site managers or security teams. Two way communication means that responses are required and recorded so everything is fully traceable and can be used for reporting after the event. React can be uniquely customized to meet the needs of your site, including specialized alerts and branding for your business. React can connect to a huge range of other systems on site, including Ramtex, WES or WISE platforms, and many other third party applications. It even operates very effectively as a complete standalone system. Contact us today to discuss your specific requirements and prepare yourself to React. So, so this is what the, the platform look like, looks like. So again, any, any notifications that you get from the web system, it's gonna, gonna notify the, the, the React platform and it will show up on various different ways like this. So you, what we can do now is upload the, the site plans and things like that. So if there is an activation on the system, it will pinpoint where that unit has been, uh, has been activated from. So it enunciates what's been, been happening on the site. And um, it does have various other functions as well. So um, SOS facilities, you saw in the, in the video, if something happens, someone can press this. If, as long as they've got the GPS activated on their phone, it will give the GPS location of where that's been activated from. Um, it has a lone worker function as well. So um, this will count down um, from a preset time. If they check in that they're okay, it's not going to alarm, it's not going to, to notify anybody. If that time does run out and they don't check in that they're okay, it's going to notify the person and, and also give their location. If something happens during that countdown phase, they can override that as well with the SOS function. Um, we also have hazard reporting as well. So this is really handy. So this, this is separate from the, the, the WES system, in fact. So the, the React platform can be totally separate to the, to the WES. It doesn't need to be um, one of the same. Each can work independently from each other. So if, if there's a hazard on site, say there's a trench that's open, there's a hole in the fence, something like that, what the hazard report allows you to do is take a photo of the incident, make some notes next to it, 
pinpoint the location and then you can upload it to the to the system and then it will log that as activities here so you can see all the different activities and in date and time stamps that as well so you've got a record of when this hazard was raised when it was accepted by the the operative to deal with when it was closed off and then again you've got that full date and timestamp all through that process so again it, it mitigates any kind of litigation that you've got you can raise alerts from the app as well for a fire for a medical emergency and again that will go to to every other person that has the, the react app on their phone and you can set all different levels as well so it can be for individual sites it can be site-wide it can be region specific so it's it's all um it's all um sizable from that those different aspects as well So that has brought me to the end of the presentation. I know it was a lot of information. It's a brand new product to the market, and I'm sure there's going to be um, quite a few questions. So I'm uh, happy to free up a, a quite a bit of time now to, to go through those. Well, thanks, Perfect. John. I re really appreciate the presentation, and I can see by the clock on the wall behind you, you cut into your dinner time here as well. So we appreciate you working <laughs> on our timelines. Um, as obviously John has demonstrated here, the uh, West 3 system can drastically improve your emergency response plans, improve your site safety. It's providing an easy setup. It's a dedicated system. It's very movable and interchangeable. It has those powerful cloud options that are available, uh, remote notifications and access tools, and very customizable to the needs that you need. So this all adds up to giving like a whole new level of assurance, peace of mind, and making sure your site's prepared for these sorts of things. Um, further information is also available uh, on the Level Safety website, uh, complete with links, uh, educational products, testimonies, that sort of stuff. Um, our products are also listed on our e-commerce store. Um, so if you do need to reach out for a, a demonstration, pricing, etc., by all means, contact your local Level Safety branch uh, or a representative from each of those branches. You might know your your personal account manager. Whatever you'd like to do, we're there to help fit those needs. Uh, I'm prepared to do demonstrations remotely. John also can assist us in a lot of the more technical stuff. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. And I guess now we'll let Matt open the questions from the chat uh, and we'll get to the questions that are out there. If any questions aren't answered in the time we have allocated, I know we're getting very tight. Uh, they will be answered by email following the webinar. So go ahead, Matt. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, so. The first question we have is, can one base handle multiple buildings on one property, or how does that work? Okay, good question. So, um, what we gen you can, it depends on distances. So, um, what what I think the question is alluding to is zoning. So, what we if if it's um, we've seen it on places like university campuses and things like that, where you have multiple buildings around, but you don't necessarily want to evacuate the full site should something happen on one of those buildings. So what we would do then is to have multiple base stations. So each base station would be its own zone. So that would then zone the product. So you can do it from one base station, um, to, but that would give a full site-wide evacuation. Um, if you wanted to zone it into individual plots or individual buildings, then we would recommend multiple base stations to give those individual zones. And then even if they are in close proximity, if I had another um, set, if I had another set of units here and I set them up on their own network, they wouldn't interfere with each other. Those, the wireless is encrypted to each individual zone. So even if they're stood next to each other, but they're on two separate networks, they're not going to interfere with each other as well. Okay. And will the system pick up airborne chemical releases, for instance, high CO levels? That's a great question. And again, this is this is part of the um, it's actually on our R&D um, task list at the moment, because, again, we've seen this more as we've come into to North America and especially Canada. So in the cold temperatures, you have heating equipment and things like that, which, again, has the potential to give off CO2 and things like that if it's not working correctly or if you have generators and, and things like that on site. So it doesn't at the moment. It is really heat and smoke, but we are developing a CO sensor in the near future fantastic uh, and derek this may be a question more for you uh but what are the options uh for the wes3 in terms of buying renting 
uh, or leasing? Oh uh, yeah, we're quite flexible for what uh, works for your particular site. Uh, some people choose to do the purchase method. Obviously, if you have ongoing construction sites and want to move it from site to site, purchase could make sense uh, for short-term projects. Uh, rental is available, and and we have worked out some leasing agreements, but we prefer to stay with the the rental or the purchase platforms. Fantastic. Thank you for the clarification on that. Uh, and then have there been any instances of the unit signals being disrupted, John? Again, good question. So um, part of the EN54 testing that we have to do in Europe is a lot about that is there's, there's a section called EN54-25. Um, and that is about the integrity of the wireless network. So we have to prove that radio signals don't interrupt the system and the other way around as well our system doesn't interrupt any other radio devices so um we have had some kind of interference if there's large power supplies like if there's a, a generator there and not a generator like a big transformer building or something like that but again it doesn't impede it it might restrict it a little bit um but again you get all those notifications on the on the base station to say if there is any signal issues um we have the system installed on um, large infrastructure projects, so airports is very common, they're complex buildings, um, a lot of radio frequencies around, um, and again, we don't, we don't have any interruptions from that, it can't, it can't have, it's a, it's a life safety system at the end of the day, so wireless technology is Ramtech's bag, <laughs> we've been doing that for 30 years, so that really is our forte. And the bandwidth is registered in the CRTC too, correct John? Correct. Yep. Yep. We have, um, I believe it's CFCC um, certification. Um, so yeah, that's all. That's all included with the system. Perfect. Uh, and since the system is totally wireless, is there a thought of developing a FOB type unit that can be carried on personnel uh, for triggering the alarm? Yeah. So you can trigger the alarm manually with the, with the call point anyway. Um, so if somebody presses this button, that's going to evacuate the full site. Again, you've got the inspection delay to mitigate anybody messing around with it and that kind of stuff. So a manual activation to press this is um, is to evacuate the site. Um, the key fob side of it, we 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 are looking into things like wearable technologies and things like that. That's that's further down the line, and and the, there are technologies out there where you have RFID tags where. If the fire watch is walking around, they have to, to clock in to say that they've been in these certain locations. So it's it's all on the on the drawing board, if you like. Um, but the, the system as it stands is is meant to be a standalone system by itself at the moment. Perfect. All right. We do have a few more questions. Um but because we are running out of time here, I think what we'll do is we will reply to the individuals uh who are posing these questions. Uh uh, but otherwise, I'll leave it to you guys to uh, to say your goodbyes and final thoughts. Thank you, Matt. John, would you like to anything in closing? Yeah, um, just from a bit of experience over over the last twelve months, when when we do show people this and we we try and say this is an alternative to, to the air horn, like we're we're well aware that the air horn costs ten dollars. <laughs> Um, and, and this system does look very complex and it looks quite expensive, but it's actually not. It's very cost effective, especially when you bring into it a rental model and things like that. So I would suggest just to people to, to give us a try. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with, with the pricing structures that we have there, just from experience. So I know a lot of people are put off by it does look expensive. <laughs> thanks, John. And I'd just like to basically extend my thanks to everybody for taking the time today to join our webinar. And again, especially you, John. No, sorry, I couldn't be there. I'd love to. I'd love to spend more time in Canada, but there you go. We've, it's the situation that we're in. So with that, I guess we will close our webinar. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks for your time, guys. Bye bye.